invite you to take your Bibles this morning. And uh, we're going to open the Word of God this morning. We're going to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Amen. <coughs> Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you get it, if you would, I'd ask you to stand with me this morning for honoring the reading of the word of the Lord today. I'll say it again. Happy Easter Sunday. Happy Resurrection Sunday, however you choose to say it. It's happy today because of what we are celebrating this morning. And that is the same thing we should be celebrating every breathing day of our life, and that is that the tomb is still empty this morning, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is still alive. Amen? Praise the Lord. If you read with me for our text this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 12, and we'll read through verse 19 for the text this morning. Amen. This is Paul's record to the church at Corinth and his uh, defense against the resurrection or for the resurrection, you might say. Paul writes, starting in verse 12, he said, Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that, the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. As you stretch your hands this way to pray for me, I'm going to pray for you. I want to speak to you for a few moments on this resurrection Sunday morning on the gospel of the resurrection. Can we pray? Father, thank you today. Thank you for amazing grace that saves, and thank you for your tender mercies that keep us, that your faithfulness is new every morning, and your mercy is new every morning, and by that we're not consumed. We're here. We have a chance. We have an opportunity, and you've made a way for us when there seemed at times not to be a way, and we thank you for that, God. May they see not just a, a crucified Lord today, but may they see a risen Savior today, and may they see the hope of glory that is Christ in us. That Lord, if you're not in us, we have no hope, but if you're in us, we have hope everlasting and eternal. So I ask you to speak to every heart today and change every life. You'll do so by the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. We pray these things in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. We pray, and the church said, Amen, amen and Amen. You may be seated this morning in the presence of the Lord. The truth, the gospel of the resurrection. Paul goes on later in chapter 15 of where we're reading our text in verse 54. And I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open this morning. Let's read this together. He says starting in verse number 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? I can tell you it's nowhere this morning. O grave, where is thy victory? It's available this morning. He says in verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Uh, we see just in that first verse, verse 54, uh, uh, Paul's declaring that death 
was swallowed up in victory. In so much, brothers and sisters, that we must understand this morning that the Apostle Paul is telling you and he's telling me today that a resurrected body is not just a resuscitated corpse. But it's a new order of life. A life that never dies again because death is still defeated this morning by the ever-living Son of God. Praise be to His name today. And when we look at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, there's nothing on earth that can compare to what He did that day. And somebody might say, well, weren't there others, brother, that were resurrected, that were brought back from the dead? Look at Jairus' daughter. Uh, Christ raised her from the dead. Yes, He did. If you think about His brother who uh, Jesus wept over of His death, knowing, even knowing it in of Himself, He could raise Him from the dead. Matter of fact, Jesus made the statement to them that were in the house. He said, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that God might get glory. Yes, Lazarus died. Jesus came to the tomb, He spoke, and Lazarus was raised from the dead. But if you look at each case in the Bible, in the Gospel recordings, as mighty as those resurrections were, it was just temporary because it only would lengthen those people's life for just a little while. Only for them again at some point, as the Bible says, to face death. Paul tells the Hebrews that it, it is appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. So because they were resurrected, they didn't stay that way some point in the past. But at some point, they will meet death again. But when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to the blessed Son of God, it is incomparable. There's nothing like it. There's never been a story written. There's never been a song sung greater. He died once. But now He is alive forevermore and He will never die again. Right. Praise be to God. Matter of fact, let me take it a step further. There's a holy and a just God that's seated high this morning. And you'll never see His Son hang on a cross again. Next time He comes... He won't be a baby in a manger. Next time He comes, they won't whip Him at a post. Next time He comes, nobody will, will deny Him. He'll be on a white horse and He'll be coming to bring this hell on earth to an end. Praise be to God. When you look at the death of Lazarus, for instance, before the resurrection, Martha is talking so big to the Lord Jesus in John 11. Listen to what they say. Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is incomparable. There's nothing like it. There's nothing that adds up to it. You can put it on the scale and nothing can outweigh it. He is the one who declares in the very next verse, verse 25, He said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in Me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe it today? Do you believe in heart, in your heart, that Jesus is no longer in a tomb today? Do you believe that He got up on that third day? Do you believe in Acts chapter 1 that He really did ascend into the heavens? And do you believe this morning He is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you today? Yes. What was Jesus saying to Martha? Resurrection's not a day. It's a man. And I am that I am. That's good. The gospel records that these records that we're reading very clear this morning just emphasize the truth. And we see record of it again. Mark records it in chapter 6. It's the Easter story. It says that when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and 
Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. They said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? When they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. For it was very great. Oh, it was very great. It was greater than great. I don't think you can put words in the pages that tell the greatness of what that was. It says, In entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. They were affrighted. I believe it was Gabriel, because he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, the place where they laid him. But go your way. Now notice this. Tell the disciples and Peter, the one that denied him. Make sure the denier knows that he's not here. That he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. Verse 8, and they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. What, what's going on here? Well, other than the obvious of what we know of the Easter story, the women obviously were not expecting the Lord Jesus to arrive. They were not expecting for a stone to be rolled away when they got to the tomb. They were not expecting an empty tomb when they looked inside of it. They came wondering how the stone door might be opened. And this shows us that the resurrection accounts that we are talking about cannot be the means of expectation. People just don't expect anymore the truth. You can tell them the truth. Matter of fact, you can show them the truth in the Bible. And Ed and I found out you can show them and they still won't believe what you're saying to them. But I'm going to tell you one day when he splits the eastern sky there'll be no confusion anymore. There'll be no naysaying about it anymore. They will look up and the Bible says that every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess and they're going to have to say he truly is the Son of God. It shows that what we're talking about even the disciples of Jesus were not expecting it to happen. You see them in Acts 1 and they're gazing into the sky. Probably still in some question and unbelief is, is that really him? Is that really who he is? Because they're standing there and the angel's like, why are you staring? He's coming back like he said. Well, folks, he got up like he said he'd get up. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. He wasn't just talking about the temple. He was talking about this temple right here. So when we look back at our text, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 15, verse 12, where we started, listen to what he said. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? You can, you can look at this right here. And, and we might ask, why did Paul so carefully want to prove the resurrection of Jesus? It wasn't because the, the Corinthian Christians didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, he makes it clear if you look at verse 11. It says, there, Paul says, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached and so you believed. They, they believed what was going on. So then why was it so important for Paul to uh, defend the fact of the resurrection? I want you to hear me this morning. There's no resurrection without Jesus. First and foremost. There was no resurrection without the cross. And there was no resurrection without Jesus. They both had to be there. It had to be taking place. So why was it important? It wasn't that the Corinthian Christians were denying Jesus' resurrection, but it was that the Corinthian Christians were denying their own resurrection. Because listen to what Paul said in verse 13 of our text. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. 
Because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain. And ye are yet in your sins. What does that tell us today? It tells us that the resurrection proves that truth is stronger than hearsay. It's stronger than what people might say is he was... Uh, doing a, a, a lesson last night on four different scenarios talking about the flood in the beginning and how some people believe that it was just a territorial flood and it wasn't a worldwide flood. And all the beliefs of this and beliefs of that and how science actually really proves it had to be worldwide. It couldn't have been any other way. How can a boat get over a mountain unless the whole earth floods? And there was many other things that she went through, but... The point is, the truth of the word will always overcome the hearsay of man. And listen to the words of the Lord Jesus before the crucifixion. He said in John 8, 40, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth. Jesus came with the truth of God when he came to the earth. When he came as a baby, John said, And the word was made flesh dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the only begotten of the Father we saw Jesus because we saw God and we saw God because we saw Jesus he said if you've seen me you've seen the Father we were seeing the Father the day he was born but he comes with the truth of God he followed God's will his enemies sought to put him to death he was not born to live he was born to die and why did they want to put him to death well some say it was because he was screaming king and the Romans didn't like it. Some say it was because he was hollering father and the Jews didn't like that. But I believe they wanted to put him to death because they didn't want their own false view to be destroyed. They wanted to believe what they believed and they didn't want anybody else coming in and wrecking their beliefs. Jesus gave his life. He let them kill him. They didn't willingly kill him. He willingly laid his life down. But he didn't stay that way. He kept his word. And now he is alive forevermore. So what he declared came to pass. So what does that tell us today? Well, we know his word's true. We know that he's never failed us. So what does that say to me? We can trust his word. It's got a 120% track record. It's never failed. It's never let me down. It's always been true. And it's faithful and it's eternal. We can trust it. It's alive. It's an incorruptible seed. It's not a dead word. If you cut these pages, there's blood running through them. There's life in this book. There was a story I just recently read of an African Muslim who became a Christian. And his friends asked him, why have you become a Christian? And he answered them, and he said, well, it's kind of like this. Suppose you're going down the road, and suddenly the road forks in two directions. And you didn't know which way to go when you got to the fork. And there at the fork were two men, one on one side and one on the other. One on one side was dead, and the other one was alive. Who would you ask? Which way to go? The dead man can't answer you. But the alive man knows the way. If Christ's enemies had succeeded in keeping him dead, think about this. Falsehood would have been stronger and overtook the truth. But here's the good gospel news this morning. He isn't dead. He's still alive. His resurrection is the final guarantee of the unchangeable truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look with me again at verse 16. Paul says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ... Paris, this tells us something else today. 
that the resurrection proves that life is stronger than death. You know what also that tells us this morning? It tells us if there is no gospel of the resurrection, then Jesus did not rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then death has power over him and defeated him. And then if uh, death has power over Jesus, then of course he would not be God. And if Jesus is not God, then he cannot offer complete sacrifices for our sins. And if Jesus cannot complete uh, uh, offer sacrifices for our sins, then our sins are not completely paid for before God. And if my sins are not paid for before God, then I'm still in my sin today. Therefore, if Jesus is not risen, He's unable to save me. But I can tell you today, He saved me to the utmost. That's right. And as the song says, I know that I am washed in the blood of the precious Lamb. Join heirs with Jesus as I travel this far. I'm a part of the family. The family of God. Are you a part of that today? Are you saved by the blood today? Do you have a story today? Paul said in Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. If you don't have faith in God, you're not alive today. Oh, preacher, I'm breathing. I'm moving. I go to my job. I go to Walmart, pick up some groceries. No, 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 no. You're existing, but you're not living. Paul's not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Why would he make a statement like that? A man who'd been tortured time after time again, one who actually tortured Christians, one who actually destroyed churches in his previous life. And then we read in Timothy, he's getting ready to die. How can a man write a letter like this and say that I'm not ashamed of a gospel? Well, yes, it saved him. Yes, it stopped him in his tracks. Yes, it redeemed him. Yes, it did a lot of things. But greater than that, it's a gospel centered on not just a crucified Savior, but it's centered on a, a risen Lord today. That's why he's not ashamed of it. Because it didn't leave him in the shape that he was in. But it brought him out. It shined a light on him one day on a Damascus road. Let him know who he truly was because he saw who Christ really was. We don't put our faith in dead men. Some do. Some worship idols. Some trust in the blood of bulls and goats. Some make things their God. But we serve a risen Lord today. His word is alive. And if it's in you, he said, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. He said, you can ask what you will, it shall be done. Why? Because you have life in you. The life of the Son of God. The same one that walked this earth for 33 and a third years. Went about doing good, the Bible says, healed all that were oppressed of the devil. Did the will of the Father. And then when it was over, he gave up his ghost. And now he's still alive. Seated. Praying for you even now. His words are alive. They're true. Because he's alive today, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. You say, well, why? Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't believe. Maybe you just, you, you've always contemplated and you're like the skeptics. And you're like, well, I hear that story. But I've never really seen proof in my life of that story. How does he have the power to save? Because he's alive to save. And when he saves you, you then die with him. And then you are resurrected to new life. And you're now alive because he is alive in you. And Paul said that's the hope of glory. Christ 
in us. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except by me. Yes, it, it, all this is true. It's knowing Jesus and, and, and loving Jesus and, and serving the Lord can make this life better. But if anybody ever told you that when you get saved, there's no more problems, they lied to you and they're giving you a false gospel of the resurrection. Because sometimes i found that this life can have some trials. This life can have some heartaches. It can even have its disappointments. But when we understand what the Apostle Paul went through and what he meant when he wrote, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable, then we understand how difficult life can be sometimes, how difficult of a life the Apostle Paul faced. Look what all he had to endure for the Lord. And if there's not a resurrection and a heavenly reward that we're going to receive one day, then yes, misery is going to be the path that we're going to have to walk down. Can we in our own super comfortable age that we're living in say the same thing? Getting ready to close, but I want you to know that this gospel is good news today. But it's more than information. It has deep-rooted power. Because the gospel is not just advice, or well, it actually, it is not advice to people at all suggesting that they lift themselves up out of their mess because, listen... There's been times when I was rebellious that I tried to fix myself and help myself. You can't fix yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't lift yourself up out of your mess. Why? Because what you're holding on to uh, other than God has no power at all. And all will, it will do is unravel like the strings of a rope and will break right in front of you. It's power. And because it's power, it lifts you and it lifts me up. Paul does not say that the gospel brings power. He said it is power because it's God's power and God's power alone. And he doesn't share glory with anybody. When Paul writes, we are of all men most miserable, he's referring to believers. Because when you look at the unbeliever, This life only gives them any chance of pleasure, you can say. What you have here will be the only thing you'll enjoy if you're an unbeliever. Because what eternally is headed your way or what you're headed to is eternal damnation, the Bible says. All the happiness you can find in this world be all the happiness you're ever going to know about. But I want to say to an unbeliever this morning that might be listening, watching this morning, or maybe here in the house this morning, you're maybe in doubt, maybe you're in question, maybe you seem to be struggling every time you try to do right. Maybe you told God no every single opportunity you've had to tell him yes. I want to tell you the truth this morning. The Son of God lives today. So you can face tomorrow if it comes. But if you refuse him, I'm going to tell you right now, there's not a promise for another day. Paul asked a question in verse number 30. I want you to read with me. He says, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Why do you stand in question of your life every breathing hour when you can have assurance right now that come hell or high water, when it's all said and done, whether you're taken by air or you're taken by this life, you can know that on the other side it will not be eternal death, but it will be life everlasting with an eternal promise. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you the whole way. 
That doesn't just mean through this life. But if you're right with God and you're living for God and you make things right, He's still with you in eternity. That's the promise. Paul is saying here that if there was no resurrection, why would I put my life in jeopardy for the gospel? The way Paul lived his life out for the gospel was evidence of the truth of the resurrection. So hear me today in closing. I don't get up here week after week after week because I have nothing else to do. Because I'm bored uh, to death or, or I needed a weekend hobby. I do this this morning, even though there may just be a few people in the room. Because I believe that Christ is alive today. I believe that he died. I believe that he was who God said he was in the Old Testament through the prophets. That he was born of a virgin. I believe that he was conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Ghost. And I believe this morning what I believe. Uh, because it makes me what I am. And I did not make this. But every day of my life I find it continues to make me. And work on me. And fix my wrongs. And make them right. And mold me. And make me after the will of the Father. And if you'll come to the reality that you're not perfect. And even when you get your heart right with God. You'll never be perfect. And you will make mistakes. And you will mess up. But you'll realize that you are clay in the potter's hand. Hands. And not only is His hands in control of you, but He determines the speed. He determines your shape. He determines how you're going to get there. And He determines what you're going to be when it's all said and done. So you have nothing to worry about if you'll surrender to Him. That's right. Because this Word don't kill me. It's making me alive. It's keeping me alive. You got to come to the reality of the closing day that you're living in sin. Roaming in death and darkness today. And you're in need of a risen Savior. And He not only can save you, He wants to and He will. I'll close with this. I love what the Dr. Billy Graham said before he died. He said, Christ did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. That's the gospel of the resurrection. Because he lives, I can live today. So can you. Will you come to him today? Every head bowed.